man we want to talk about may come from any one of a number of sources. From the military academy at West Point, a career officer just starting out. Or from the ROTC program of any one of many colleges and universities from coast to coast. He may have received a commission from the National Guard of his home state. Or for that matter, have received a direct commission from the enlisted ranks. Or he may have enlisted specifically for officer's candidate training and a commission in the Army. But wherever this man comes from, his job is basic to the success of the United States Army in combat. His skill and ability, his leadership, these things his men and his commanders and the nation depend upon. And if they do so with confidence, that confidence is well placed because he is good at his job. He has met standards of excellence and mastered a complexity of arms, equipment and tactics completely unknown to his counterpart of years past. He is today better trained, better equipped and more professionally competent than ever before in the Army's long history. He knows his job and the importance of it. He is the platoon leader. Okay, move out. By far the largest single source of platoon leaders in today's army is the Infantry Officers Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. But the fact is, even a man who already has lieutenant's bars from West Point, ROTC or other sources must receive training here at Fort Benning before he can command an infantry platoon in combat or in a combat ready unit. So whether he's here for the full 23 weeks of OCS or the shorter combat platoon leaders course, he's got a busy time ahead of him. As a general rule, he'll be on the go from six in the morning until 10 at night, except for the long days. There is, after all, an awful lot to learn. Physical conditioning is an important part of the training, especially in the early weeks. The job of platoon leader is one that demands physical stamina, strength, agility. It's no line of work for a strong back and a weak mind. But the bodily strength has to be there, along with the ability to think quickly and clearly under stress. So the early morning runs and the obstacle course and the calisthenics all work toward one goal, to build reserves of endurance against the time what endurance may be the key to survival and victory in combat. The general rule of double timing to classes helps in the physical conditioning, but its main purpose is simply to save time. The schedule is tight, and there are a lot of classes, all of them important. What are the two basic responsibilities of all leaders? Candidate Burns. Mm -hmm. Sir, Candidate Burns, take care of my men and to get the job done. Sure, exactly right. The accomplishment of the mission and looking out for the men's welfare. The two basic responsibilities of any leader. However, if you must select one, which one would you choose and why? Candidate Halpin. Sir, Candidate Halpin, I feel that they are equally important. Okay, I'll buy that, sure. However, if a conflict exists between... To take the care of his men, a basic principle no potential leader can ignore. At the same time, he must know how to take care of himself. All right, that's 
workout done. Remember, those of you that are doing the throwing, straighten your legs fast and hard and pull down with both hands. Those of you that are falling, do not fall with a stiff arm. You will not break your fall, you'll only break your arm. Let's go! Even in this day of satellites and intercontinental missiles, there are times and places in which a combat soldier may have to depend on the primitive deadlines of his hands, feet, and elbows for self-defense. A platoon leader must master all that 20th century technology has made available to the foot soldier. He must also be adept in skills with weapons, like the bayonet, which have been familiar to generations of men under arms. Baton, a can't pull. Then that, pull. Gentlemen, when you give a command, sound like it. You know what you're doing. Bring it up from here. Keep in mind you're giving a command and not requesting something. Candidate Sparks. Sergeant Candidate Sparks. Report for instruction. Baton, a can't pull. Sergeant Candidate Sparks reports. On the platoon for close order drill. Take charge of your platoon. Right. Please. Each man, regularly and systematically, is exposed to the actuality of command. He gets the feel of command in the only way it can be gotten, through exercising the confidence, the self-discipline, and control the overall outlook which a good leader must have. And always, there are the watchful eyes of those charged with his development as a leader, seeking out the signs of leadership, searching for strength to build it up, and for any weak points, so that they can be corrected now. Sir, Kennedy Sparks, request mission to enter. I can't hear you. Come in. Sir, can Sparks report for counseling? Take your seat, Sparks. In each counseling session with his tactical officer, the potential platoon leader is given the opportunity to see at first hand the remarks on his instructor's observation report. Candidate Sparks, you're being counseled on your tour of duty as platoon sergeant the first half of last week. Yes, sir. First, let me say this. You're doing pretty well. Academically, you seem to be on top of the material. You learn fast. Yes, sir. There's one thing, though, that you may have noticed from this observation report. When in a command position, you seem to go easy. I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. You try to play it as if you were just one of the boys. When in a command situation, you take command. You can't do it gingerly. I think I see what you mean, sir. The men you lead will have buddies. They won't look to you to be a buddy. They'll look to you to take command. You may be only 21 years old, but to the men you lead, you'll be the old man. If you're not, you'll be letting them down. May as well get used to it. That's the name of the game. Yes, sir. The name of the game is leadership, and the development of this quality is the focus of every moment of the training schedule. The leader's reaction course is one ingenious aspect of this unending effort to uncover and cultivate the qualities of leadership. Its purpose is to reveal how well a man can conceive and give the orders a given situation calls for, how well he can analyze a problem, find a workable answer, and then organize the men under him to get the job done. Each problem is solvable, sometimes in more ways than one, but none of the solutions come easy, and time is always short. In groups of 10, the potential platoon leaders take a series of problems in turn. For each task, the group splits in half. Five men to attack the problem itself, and five to harass the work party, try to confuse them. These pilings represent the remains of a bridge, which has been destroyed by enemy nuclear artillery. Your survey meter indicates that portions of these pilings and the stream have been contaminated. You are part of a squad operating in enemy territory. One of your party, the dummy here, 
has been critically wounded in the back. You know that on the other side of the stream, there is a stretcher, which you will need to transport your wounded comrade back across the stream. Tough problems to be solved in limited time and under pressure. No instructions on how to do it, just that it can be done with what's on hand if they work it right. The rest is up to them. It's designed to reveal strengths and weaknesses, and it does. It happens like this. Okay, your squad has been sent back to get a drum of gasoline you observed in a rear area during your advance. When you cross a stream, on your way to get the gasoline, this bridge was intact. However, since then, enemy artillery has destroyed the center portion. This is your only way of getting across the Swift River. You must take the drum of gasoline, the planks, and the rope with you. As equipment to do this, you may use only the four planks and the rope which you will find on your span of the bridge. No one plank will span this gap. You cannot touch the ground under the bridge because it's quicksand. Any object allowed to touch the water will be swept away by the force of the current. No jumping is allowed. Alpha team under the leadership of candidate Howard, begin work. Go, 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 go.
Some groups make it, others wind up in the water. Either way, what they learn is important, and the learning goes on. Basics like map reading. There's intensive work on this. Cross-country navigation is a frequent necessity for the combat platoon leader. He has to know, and know for sure. The price of guesswork comes too high. Nowadays, a platoon leader also needs to know the tricks of reading what is significant in a photograph taken by reconnaissance aircraft. And inevitably, the ever-present necessities and procedures of Army paperwork. Administration, too, is part of the job of a platoon leader. The platoon leader also has to know quite a variety of weapons in his chosen line of work. He must know all the firepower available to the combat leader. The 45 caliber pistol. The M14 rifle, the infantryman's personal weapon. The light, high-powered M16, much favored for close action in jungle country. The reliable and potent M60 machine gun and more, a lot more. The 50 caliber machine gun. And the hand grenade. The flamethrower. And then on to the big punch firepower, the 90 millimeter recoilless rifle and its hard-hitting big brother, the 106. The indispensable, reliable 81 millimeter mortar. And on up from there to the armored punch of the 90 millimeter tank gun. And the still heavier 105 millimeter. And finally, for long range, accurate fire support, the howitzers, the 105, and the Sunday punch, 155. All in all, quite an array of firepower, and the platoon leader must be familiar with the full spectrum of it. Just as important as firepower is mobility, and every potential platoon leader gets a thorough orientation on all the modes of tactical mobility available to infantry forces. In fact, a basic orientation on the maintenance of standard vehicles is part of the curriculum. The platoon leader also needs to know the performance capabilities of the machines which will move him and his men. He needs to know, and he is shown, wherever he may need to go, there is army transport that can get him there. But there is terrain which makes ground transport impractical. For this too, there is an answer. The Army helicopter. Firepower, mobility, and the third major essential of combat effectiveness, communications. 
Here, too, there is a wide range of equipment to fill specific needs. At one end of the spectrum, the familiar field telephone equipment, and from there through the light and powerful man-carried field radios. And on to the vehicle-mounted FM equipment. The function of command, as the platoon leader of today knows it, is virtually impossible without them. To command any unit, a leader must be able to do two things. First, know what's going on, and second, tell his people what they have to do. Both are wrapped up in the single word, communications. Surely, swiftly, today's platoon leader can receive reports from the field, pass on orders from above, or give orders of his own. And the specialized language called for is a study all its own. Roger, Wilco, out. Roger Wilco. Wrong. We never use Roger Wilco together. What do you mean when you use the pro word Roger? I have received your transmission. I have received your transmission satisfactorily. What do you mean when you use the pro word Wilco? I will comply. I will comply. But before you can comply, you first have to receive it, understand it, and then comply. And again, never use the pro words Roger Wilco together. Nor will the pro words over and out be used together because they have opposite meaning. Now you picked up this Roger Wilco over out when you were looking at your TV show. Remember, they're dealing in cereal and cold town. As an infantry platoon leader, you're dealing in real estate and human lives. A laugh or two helps keep things moving, but the potential platoon leader never loses sight of the fact that his instruction, all of it, is aimed at preparing him to lead men into combat. As his training progresses, he finds himself functioning in the position of command in various field exercises. He gets a realistic taste of what it's like to have in his charge a group of able and trusted men, to have the responsibility of guiding their actions so that the mission is accomplished, to be, in fact, the old man. Romeo 6, this is Romeo 36, over. This is Romeo 36, Papa Lima Pear. I say again, Papa Lima Pear, over. His objective, a remote village. His mission, search and clear. Call the villagers. Lang Nai, Bai Bao Ve, Bong Toi Moon Sim, Dak Kei Na. Lang Nai, Bai Bao Ve, Bong Toi Moon Sim, Dak Kei Na. informs them that the village is surrounded and that it must be searched. Exact instructions are given to the people, assuring their safety if they comply. The villagers will gather in one part of the village, while only the head of each household remains in front of his hut. The platoon leader has been taught how to use his men to ensure each step of the way with firepower. He does so. The approach is made by the numbers, but this is no dry schoolbook exercise. The numbers themselves have evolved out of hard, specific combat experience. Nothing can be assumed, nothing left to chance. He sends in his fire support element first to make a brief check and provide security for the searchers that will follow. He's trained to know what to look for and the likely places to look.
in searching a house, he's been taught the wisdom of having the head of the house go along. Effective insurance in case of booby traps. It's also wise to keep a close eye on the villager. Maybe it's training, but it's realistic. And the outcome depends in large part on his alertness, his know-how, his estimate of the situation, the rightness of his decisions and orders. His are the eyes that must see it all and make sure it all goes right. As the long weeks of intensive work have passed, each potential platoon leader has steadily grown in skill, in knowledge, in confidence and experience. He's come to know himself and his hidden reserves of stamina better than he would have thought possible. He has learned the responsibilities and the satisfactions of command. At least he has begun to. The 205th Brigade arrives at Camp McCoy from 28 cities in Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Its units range from the oldest in the United States Army to the newest. The Old Guard is here, and the 14th Artillery, the 17th Infantry, the 409th, and the 410th. The 33rd Armor and the 4th Cav are represented. There are engineers to build bridges, searchlight companies to light them, smoke companies to conceal them. There are military police, military intelligence, and military public information units. An aviation company to fly the choppers and the gunships. A support battalion to link them all together. The brigade brings with it the battle-hardened veteran, the decorated officer, the army-wise sergeant, and the raw recruit. The immediate mission will be to weld these units and these men into a cohesive, mobile, self-supported striking force. To one man, the mission is paramount, for he must prove his unit's work. Barber, Arnold T., Brigadier General, Commanding. The mission of this brigade is to move from our assembly area at this point and move into a mobile defense with preparation of launching attack. For the intelligence, we have this information at this time. We have two mechanized battalions to our front. They're located generally in these two areas. We have two tank battalions that have been reported moving down this highway here. Lights burn through the night. Orders are on the way. The mission, Jack Pine 1. In the war room at Corps headquarters, each unit of the brigade becomes a box or circle or flag or pin on the huge situation map. Radios crackle urgent commands, nerves tingle, the pulse pounds, the brigade breathes. The garage will go to the field. It will turn twisted metal into functional parts. In the motor pool, routine maintenance is now top priority. Emergency aid packs, plasma, bandages, information tags, and medications are moving down a hasty production line in the medical company. The materiel, the men, the machines are moving on the mission. Field rations, generators, communications wires, and freighted ammunition, reaching a rendezvous at dawn.
2nd Platoon, Charlie Company, 4th Battalion, 33rd Armor, commanded by Lieutenant Dale John Wirth, a 26-year-old officer trained at Fort Knox and rising through the ranks to a commission. Like many armor officers or tank commanders, Wirth teaches tactics which take advantage of the tank's mobility, firepower, and brawn. A tank has actual and psychological powers. Worth will use all of them in his mission. Artillery, Bravo, speed, and four, power. One, one, zero. Bravo sight, plus four. Bravo sight, plus four. Deflection, two, seven, three, two, quadrant, two, eight, seven. Center, one round. Battery, one round in effect. Artillery units are trained to react instantly. Crews receive a mission, pull off the road, train the howitzers on a target perhaps seven miles away. Umpires and evaluators mark score sheets, adding to the pressure. Three rounds will be fired for record. The air attacks have finished. The shelling has died away. The infantry will take the high ground. The infantry waits, wet, worn, weary, in the mist of dawn. The infantry feels its belly churn in the moments before attack. The infantry moves on foot in the driving rain or in the treacherous quiet of the sun-dappled wood. He is called a dog face. He carries his home upon his back, marches through three pair of boots, lives off the land, sleeps where he can, eats from a brown box labeled meal, combat. He is fair target from the concealed bunker, the long-range guns, the mortars, and from the sky behind the hill. The heavy timber, this is noisy money alpha. We are being held up by a company of aggressors, not snipers and small arm fighters. The separate infantry brigade has infinite capabilities. It can launch an armor spearhead, command artillery, feed and clothe itself, establish its own communications, and through its powerful generators, light an entire city. Combat engineers build bridges of every description. Their bridges carry tanks, trucks, equipment, supplies, and men. The infantry is on the move.
firepower is not enough. It must be mobile. The 106 millimeter recoilless rifle meets such requirements. It is Jeep mounted. It packs an armor piercing punch from 8,500 yards. is a massive 4.2 inch mortar mounted on the carrier or fired from the ground. It will hurl its shell 6,000 yards with pinpoint accuracy. Number two, deflection, 0795. In its role as a self-supporting force, the brigade must care for itself on the attack, on the defense, and in grim moments of tragedy. It replies with intensively trained professionals in its medical company. It responds to the urgent call with ambulance and helicopter. Time is precious. The skilled corpsmen will waste none of it. Their techniques are far advanced from those used in World War II and in Korea and to the rear, the surgeons are ready. They will complete the business of saving lives. Beefy and burly, he commands a recon platoon. Schiebler, William J., First Lieutenant, Third Infantry, 26. Ranger, paratrooper. His specialty is an old one, forged behind rock walls and hedgerows, sharpened in countless gullies and along a thousand dusty roads, home in the jungles of Vietnam. Bill Schiebler's specialty is the quick kill, ambush. Citizen soldiers are going home, and with them ratings which range from excellent to superior. The combat veterans, the decorated officers, the army-wise sergeants, and the raw recruits are moving with a purpose. freedom's flag as they have since Concord Bridge. They carry on the rich and hard-won traditions of Breed's Hill and Red Beach One, of Cowpen and Bellow Wood, of Utah and Hill 609, of the Han and of the Rhine. 
In the weeks and months that follow, they will continue to pray. For if they are called again, they must be ready. These men of the brigade.